Well, good morning, family. Uh, it's great to welcome you into our home this morning for church. I'm Pastor Ryan, and welcome to Christ Church Oceanside. Um, it's a joy for me to introduce to you today um, our Archdeacon. So he oversees uh, the island on behalf of our Bishop, Bishop Trevor. Um, and he serves what's called our deanery. And that is the all the clergy on the island in our area, we gather together, or at least we did before COVID. Um, and we would gather together in Victoria and encourage one another and talk about what the Lord is doing in our parishes. And Rob Zoe is our archdeacon. And so he is the rector of the Church of Our Lord, which is in Victoria, downtown Victoria, right by the museum there. And it's a beautiful spot. And Archdeacon Rob is leading so wonderfully. And so he is graciously coming to join us uh, through video to preach uh, today on what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And I, I just can't um, say enough good about him. He has served me so well since moving to the island, has been a constant source of encouragement and strength to me. And just nice to know I've got a friend here who's backing me up. So I'm very excited to have him come and preach on grace today. And so you're going to love him. And hopefully we get to see more of him and in person uh, that you would get to know him in the coming years. Now, our psalm reading this morning is from Psalm chapter 67, and it is an epic psalm. And so it's a joy for me to be able to read this over you today as we prepare our hearts to move into worship in song. So Psalm chapter 67, beginning in verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. This is our story, the word of the Lord. Well, again, hear those beginning verses. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. This is central to the vision of Christ Church is that we want to clearly follow the way of Jesus in such a way that his way may be known over all the earth. Specifically, though, that the saving power of the way would be known through our testimony among all nations. And so when we say we are followers of Jesus, it means that we are following the way that he has achieved before us, that we follow what he has done and what he has accomplished, and we live from that way. And so we, when we live that way and follow that way, are in his blessing, and that his blessing would be poured out over us, and in his way that his grace would shine upon us. And so I pray this over you today, my dear friends, who I love deeply in Jesus, would you feel and know the blessing of Christ upon you? Would it fill your hearts? Would it bring peace to your minds? Would it heal your bodies, whatever ails you now? And would it fill your home so that the world would see the goodness of the way of Jesus? And so we thank you, Father, for this good way. And we give our hearts to it deeply today, genuinely investing our whole lives to trusting in Jesus as your way. And we worship you, being filled with your presence, 
because of all the goodness that you have revealed in him. And we pray this in his name. Amen.
Well, good morning. It's great to be with you today. My name is Rob Zoe. I'm the rector at Church of Our Lord in Victoria and also uh, an archdeacon in the Anglican Network in Canada. And really glad that Ryan asked me to be part of your sermon series on uh, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Uh, that's a question that's topmost in my mind all the time as a follower of Jesus, that longing to be more mature and to be growing continually and that's the race we're running. So it's great to be here. I really, um, just before I get into the, the series here, I also realized I made a horrible mistake. I forgot to ask Ryan how long his sermons usually are. So if I go a bit on the long side, the mistake is all with me, okay? Don't blame Ryan, it's me, because I didn't ask. Um, it is uh, a great topic. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Just before we get into that, Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, we bow our heads in your presence this morning with humble hearts and grateful hearts. Lord, may your word be our rule, your Holy Spirit, our guide and teacher. And may we give the best part of ourselves, our energy, our time, and our commitment to bringing glory to your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I know Bishop Trevor in his... Um, part of the series, uh, talked about something which I thought was fantastic. He said that when we're a follower of Jesus, we shift from being a person with a mission to being a person on someone else's mission. What a great insight that is. We change from leading to following. We change from being in control to being out of control, from being ultimately responsible to not having the responsibility. I really appreciate what Bishop Trevor had to say. 
my part of this series is going to be delving into a word, and the word is grace. And I think as you follow Jesus, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? One of the things it does mean is learning a second language and learning God's language and learning these great words we have in Scripture, which mold us and shape us as disciples. It's not a natural language. We're not born with these words. We have to learn them. And as we learn them, we grow as disciples. So the word for today is grace. And when Jesus calls you to be one of his followers, part of your growth is learning these words, learning what they mean, learning how they shape you, learning that these words are authoritative words in our lives. And they're words that we need to not just learn, but to use in our daily walk as disciples. And this is hard work because it's not our natural language. It's like learning a second language. If you're unilingual like I am, learning a second language isn't easy, especially at my age. It's hard work, but it's worthwhile. And especially as disciples, when we learn a second language, the wonder and the grace and the mercy of God just unlocks in new ways because we understand more deeply what it means to be in Christ. So today, the word is grace. The word is grace. The modern age that we live in today, in 2020 on Vancouver Island, well, this modern age, this secular age we live in, it uses words and it uses language to win followers and influence people. And that's fine. There's nothing inherently wrong with that because we are creatures who use language. But I noticed that our modern era is really obsessed with, with several things, one of them being sex. The other thing it's obsessed with is identity. Who are we as people? Does someone impose an identity on me? Do I choose it for myself? Do I get to choose my personal pronouns and then make sure people use them when they're talking about me? I think underneath all of this is the uh, desire of the individual to have absolute control over everything in our lives. And that includes choosing my identity. Well, as Christian disciples, <clears throat> we're not autonomous. We follow Christ. We're his servants. The New Testament goes so far as to say we're slaves of Christ. So that's not someone who's choosing their own identity. Actually, God brings us to new birth and lets us see what our new identity is. He gives us our identity in Christ. Our identity in Christ is revealed to us through the gracious and loving God. And one of the ways he does this is through the words of Scripture. And one of these key words running through all of Scripture is the word grace. The word grace. That word grace is a great little word. It's an easy word to use, and we toss it around. We use it carelessly, probably, often. But how are you using it in your discipleship language? How do you understand it? And how do you explain it to someone else? How does it mold you and shape you? Well, I'd like you to open up your Bible, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2, and beginning at verse number 1. Ephesians 2, verse 1. That's what we're going to be looking at today. Two things to see in Ephesians 2. First of all, <clears throat> who we are by nature. Who are we naturally as people? And then secondly, who are we by grace? Who are we by grace? So nature and grace. And we can only understand the second point about grace when we understand the first point about nature. We can only receive God's grace when we admit who we are by nature. So let's start with our natural state who we are by nature. Well, if you look at Ephesians 2 and verses 1 to 3, you'll see that it uh, is pretty grim reading. It, it's not pretty. It tells us that we need to be willing to look at ourselves in the light of what this says. Who am I by nature? Well, Paul's telling us here in Ephesians. And keep in mind, this is who we are before God brings us to new birth. Very important to see that that we were dead in transgressions, but when we're in Christ, we're no longer dead in transgressions because we've been made alive in Christ. Now, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, 
captures all of humanity. This is all of us. If you think you're not part of this, then I'm, I, I'm sorry to, to ruin your nice Sunday morning by saying that this includes all of humanity. This is every tribe, language, and nation. These are the ones Jesus sent his apostles to go to. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, the Great Commission, this is the world Jesus was sending his church to go and reach and to take the good news to. This is Vancouver Island. This is who we are by nature. And Ephesians 2 is saying, look, humanity's in the same boat, and it's a pretty leaky boat by nature. It needs fixing, and we need someone to come and rescue us from the leaky boat. So that's what we're going to see here as we look into grace. So Paul's words are meant to, to remind these people in Ephesus of their natural state before God's grace was revealed to them. So I hope that's an encouragement to you. This is who you were by nature and will be moving to who you are now by grace. So notice what Paul says there in Ephesians 2.1. The Ephesians were dead in their transgressions and sins, meaning they were spiritually dead and they were dry. And I know that's tough to hear, but it means that in our natural state before faith in Christ, we're hopeless. We're lost. We're helpless. It means that we have no natural goodness or righteousness that's going to win us favor with God. Nothing. We're lost by nature. The early church father, St. Augustine, called this original sin. And many people struggle with the idea of original sin because it's difficult. And it is difficult. It's very uncomfortable. But it's important to know that it's biblical teaching. It's not something Augustine made up to control the people in his church. It's not something Paul makes up. It's not something that Ryan makes up to keep you under control and keep you under his thumb. This is biblical teaching. The teaching of original sin has been abused in the past. And we have to admit that up front that sometimes preachers and teachers have misused it in order to keep people under control and to give people the impression that there's nothing they can ever do to be happy in their relationship with Christ. Well, that, that's really unfortunate. That's a mistake. What Ephesians 2 is doing is simply pointing out the truth of our natural state before God's grace is revealed. And I think as we look around at our world, we see this natural state on full display, don't we? I think we see it in our own lives as well. We see it in our state before we come to Christ, and we see it peeking through from time to time, trying to win out over our new identity in Christ. And if you think this is something only limited to Paul's letters, listen to something King David says in the Old Testament in Psalm 51. This is what King David says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And then he cries out to God, cleanse me, wash me. Well, as the anointed king, David admitted his fallen nature, and he cried out to God to make him clean and to give him a savior. And that's a crucial posture for disciples, to recognize our brokenness and our fallen nature and to cry out to God to repair us and give us the savior. So this sinful nature isn't something that appears in Paul's letters for the first time. It actually appears in Genesis chapter 3, way at the beginning of the Bible. That's the first time it appears. It makes its final appearance in Revelation 22. That's the whole Bible. It's everywhere running through that. Human nature is a thread running through all of Scripture, but it's a very warped thread. It's very twisted, but it's there. And without this thread of human nature running through all of Scripture, then God's grace wouldn't have been necessary. The cross wouldn't have been necessary. Let me explain that. When Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, he meant that the sacrifice of himself, of his own blood shed, paid the full cost. God's wrath has been satisfied forever. Judgment was turned aside because it was put upon Christ and not on the people who deserved it, which is us, humanity in our sinful nature. 
And it's hard to imagine why Jesus would have gone to the cross and died such an agonizing death if human sin wasn't all that serious. If it was something that could be dismissed with the wave of Jesus' hand, why wouldn't he have done that? I mean, he did that with disease, didn't he? He said, be gone, and it was gone. But human sin, that needed the sacrifice of himself. And that's what he came to do. It's so serious that it needed him to pay the cost. So if sin isn't something that's in, a, in us by nature, then we are okay on our, on, our, on our own. And we can save ourselves. But I hope we all know that that's not the case. If sin is something that's in, it, in us by nature, that's another story, isn't it? That's a story that needs a word like grace. So Ephesians 2 uh, paints an unflinching picture of the human heart. And my heart and your heart, it's on full display here for everyone to see. And we should recognize ourselves. Now you may be a person like me who wants to skip over these verses, who wants to go quickly past these three verses and say, well, this is a bit of a downer. This is a bit depressing. This doesn't sound good. And I'd like to move to the good parts coming in verse number four. And again, that's very understandable. But I really encourage you to stay with this, to stay with the hard parts because we need to see this. Let me share a quote from a very gifted evangelist named Rico Tice. Rico says, grace is only amazing when sin is clearly seen. Grace is only amazing when sin is clearly seen. That's what we have here. This is sin. This is human nature on full display with cravings, disobedience, desires, and God's just wrath. So this is the ground we begin walking over as people in this world. This is the ground we walk over. But by God's grace, this isn't the ground we stay on. We don't stay here. God doesn't leave us on that thorny patch of ground, not at all, not at all. He takes us somewhere else. So that's nature. That's who we are by nature. Now we move to who we are by grace. So in the rest of the passage in Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10, we see God's gift on full display for us to see. This is a huge shift here, away from our nature to our new identity in Christ. And let me read verse 4 to you. Ephesians 2, verse 4. So Paul's just said, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Wow, that's heavy. Listen to verse 4. But, but, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, and then he goes on. Notice that word, but. The word but, that's a huge shift in teaching here. It's saying that our natural state isn't the end of the story. God's grace is moving here. This is the story of God's grace. And when we're hearing the story of God's grace, it doesn't end in fallen human nature. God's grace starts a new creation, a new life. Healing, forgiveness, meaning, and purpose. A new identity in Christ. New hope, new joy, new strength in suffering. Everything that comes to us by being in Christ. It comes to us by grace. One definition of grace is unmerited favor. And that's a great definition, unmerited favor. What Paul does is he puts flesh on the word. And he fleshes it out here. In verse number four, he says, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy. So there we see that grace means great love, and it means rich mercy. That's what God's grace means. And that's what's been given to you as a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important for you to know this word as a follower of Jesus Christ, to know who you are in Christ, to know who God is, this amazing God who's brought you to new birth in Christ. And it's so important that we see how Paul fleshes out the word because otherwise it's just a word. 
And we can easily say to people, well, you're so gracious to me, or thank you for your grace. But here Paul fleshes it out, and it takes the word from being just a word with an empty promise, like a a word from the campaign trail from a politician, into something we can stake our lives on, because these are God's words, and God has put his meaning into this word. And notice something else here in the passage in Ephesians 2, verse 5. Let me read that to you. God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Do you know what Paul's doing there? He's taking the word grace and like a good engineer, he's strapping a jet engine onto it and he's sending it out there. And it takes off. Grace takes off. We start in verse number four by learning that God's grace means great love for us and that God is rich in mercy. Here comes the jet engine. Because of his great love for us, God who's rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. How do you know God's grace is real in your life? Well, because you know Christ as your Lord and Savior. God's grace is real to you. That's evidence of his grace. How do you know Christ is your Lord and Savior? Because of God's grace. It's been made real to you. And I hope you know that you've been born again because you call Jesus Lord and Savior and you follow him. This is an incredible word. There there are so many layers to this. That's why it's so important to make this word one of the main words in your vocabulary as a disciple. This is the word that begins it all, grace. There are many other words as well as you learn a second language. Words like regeneration, propitiation, sin, confession, repentance, eternal life. But it begins with grace. That's the word we need to start with. Well, I'm going to move to application in just a minute, you know, how this filters down into our daily lives. But before we get to application, Paul gives a warning in the rest of the passage. And we wonder here, are we going back into the sinful nature? Are we going back into the bad news? Well, we wonder if a warning is necessary. Well, it is. Remember that Paul wrote to the Ephesians to help them spiritually grow and to help them mature in Christ. And Paul seems to feel that a warning is necessary. Why? Well, because we easily forget and we fall back into our old ways. Listen to Ephesians 2, 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And then he says, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Paul gives a strong reminder there because he knows the human heart. He's talking about his own heart too. This is what we all do. We hear the good news, we enjoy it, we we receive it, but we easily forget and we slip back into our old ways. The other day I was reading Psalm 78 in my morning quiet time. And Psalm 78 tells the story of Israel feasting on heavenly manna in the wilderness and drinking water from the rock and enjoying every blessing that God gives, freedom from slavery and the spiritual food that sustains to eternal life. But then they quickly forget. Listen to verse 32 of Psalm 78. In spite of all this, in spite of all the blessings, they kept on sinning. In spite of God's wonders, they did not believe That's humanity. We receive God's blessings. We're sitting down at the meal enjoying and we get up and we've walked a few feet from the banquet table and we forget and we go back to our old ways. That's why we need to be reminded. Well, the good news is that we're not defined by our human nature anymore. You're a new person in Christ. But here's the important part here. The old nature still clings to us. It's still there. You're still engaged in a battle, in a spiritual battle against what the New Testament calls the flesh. 
So Paul's warning put into modern words could be like this. He's saying, enjoy God's grace. Enjoy it. Give thanks always, but don't get cocky. Don't get cocky in your walk with Christ. It's not because of your greatness or your goodness that you're saved by grace. You're saved because of God's grace. So let's move on now to application. That's what Paul sets up here. He deals with human nature and now who we are by grace. But how does grace help you as you follow Christ? Well, the reason any of us are sitting here today uh, worshiping and learning what the word grace means is because of God's grace moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. This small word has an eternal flavor, and it's meant to shape how we serve Jesus as disciples. As I mentioned just a minute ago, I think this is the word we need to begin with, the word grace. Because grace is the thread that runs through all of Scripture. It's there from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And we know in Genesis 3, the thread of human nature comes in, but God's grace wins the day. And it's all about God's grace. We see grace in creation, in the fact that God made everything that is, including us. We see it in the covenants. We see it supremely in the cross, don't we? God's grace is everywhere. It touches every part of the universe, including us today. So Ephesians is a very practical letter. If you study it, and I hope you'll take some time this week to read it, it's only six chapters, but it roughly breaks into two. The first part of Ephesians is teaching. It's beautiful, brilliant teaching. Beautiful doctrine, which is teaching and theology. Then the other half is practical application. How do we put this into practice? Monday through Saturday, how do we do that? The first part of Ephesians is meant to thrill your senses. Read Ephesians 1 and then 2. And I challenge you to not be thrilled by what you read there. It's beautiful. This is amazing. It's, it's beautiful teaching about who you are in Christ by grace. Chosen before the creation of the world to be in Christ. Then the second part of the letter, the last three chapters, that's the practical application where you go out and you live in the world and serve the hungry and the poor and even your enemies using the teaching you've received, using the formation you've received as disciples in the first part of the letters. So we were made to be sharers of God's grace. We were made to be people who are formed by grace and then people who go out and share the grace. So first we experience grace and then we have to share it. So let me move here to just the last part and wrap up this message. I'd like to finish here by reading from Ephesians 2 and verse number 10, which says this. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. If you're looking for a verse of practical application for how you actually live the Christian life, this would be one of the best. It clearly says we were made for good works. We weren't made to do our own thing. We weren't made to go our own way. We were made to serve Christ. Now we love to have our own freedom, don't we? But when we obsess over our own freedom to choose and do whatever we want, then we're rebelling against our creator. We're living in rebellion in the good world God's put us in. Scripture says that you weren't made randomly. Human life isn't an accident. You didn't somehow evolve out of the primordial soup. It's not how it happened. You were made by God through Christ, in Christ for this one purpose to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. Ephesians 2.10. Along the way, as we do this, we enjoy all the good things God gives us in this world. The beauty of creation, the harvest, the sun and the rain, a summer's day on Vancouver Island, does it get any better than that? And as we do that, well, other things happen, don't they? We suffer. We experience joy and heartache, and eventually we die. But the main purpose is for us to grow in Christ. How do we do that? 
Well, we grow personally, but we also grow as we do these good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. That's what he's made us for. Now think about that for a minute. Later this week, as you love your neighbor, as you help the hurting stranger or the, or the homeless person, as you feed the hungry, as you reach out to do something good for someone else, you are being obedient to Christ as a disciple. You're giving a visible sign of God's grace. You're, you're touching down in a person's life with the grace of the Lord Jesus. And that's why good works are so important. They're like little healing signs to those who are desperately searching for hope. They're a sign to them that there is a God who loves his people and has sent his people into the world. They're signs of who Jesus Christ is. And they're so desperately important that we do them. It's also desperately important because our good works are invitations for us to witness to Christ and then hopefully be able to give an invitation for others to at least consider Christ for themselves. To say, this is why I'm doing this. This is what motivates me to do this, is because of the grace given to me in Christ. And then happily, the result of the good works aren't up to us. Don't worry about the results. Leave that up to the Holy Spirit. Our part is to believe that God's given us good works to do that these good works have been prepared in advance from before creation, if you can get your head around that. And when we do these things as a response to God's grace, he gets the glory. As you do good things, people will try to give you the glory. We need to resist that. Instead, we need to stand with the apostles and all the great saints from the past and give all the glory to the God who's given us his grace. We might even uh, repeat what Jesus says to his first followers in Luke 17. In the story Jesus told, there's a servant who served the master. And instead of expecting a reward, here's what Jesus says the servant should say. We are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. We've only done our duty. Our duty is to serve the God who's poured out his grace in such a lavish way upon us and upon the rest of his people. So how do you follow Jesus? I want to suggest to you, you follow him by learning this word. Make the word grace part of your living vocabulary as a disciple. And do these good works because good works are a necessity and a privilege. As disciples touched by grace, we should stand in wonder and awe at the grace of God poured out upon us. Again, read Ephesians 1 and, and, and see the power of God. Our nature has been redeemed. Grace has been poured out. Why? Because God is rich in mercy and he loves his people. Even when we were spiritually dead, what did he do? He made us alive with Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, we struggle to even imagine your grace. But we thank you for your word, Lord, in Ephesians 2. Thank you for the way grace is explained to us and made tangible. So Lord, we respond by thanking you for this rich gift, the most valuable prize, the Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And we ask now, Lord, that you would Give us a renewed zeal to go out and serve you with good works, to serve and love our neighbors, to love our enemies. Why? Well, because you loved us and we've been made alive in Christ. And we want to give you all the glory. Amen. We're going to end this morning by singing the Apostles' Creed. This song is called, This I Believe, the Creed. Creating one, God Almighty, and through your holy.
Holy Spirit conceiving Christ the Son Jesus our Savior I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit our God is three and one I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe Judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Ever seated, I sing, I believe, oh, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection That we will rise again For I believe in the name of Jesus Yes, I believe in the name of Jesus Oh, I believe in the name of Jesus